That would be good. Okay, so uh, welcome to uh, data science learning community. We're working through the book, The Effect. Uh, this is uh, part two of chapter 14 on matching. Uh, just a brief reminder uh, from last week, matching uh, is an alternative to regression uh, when we're doing causal analysis using observational data. Um, it is, uh, matching is very common in, in my field. I'm an, I'm an actuary or just in healthcare when you're managing, or when you're evaluating healthcare in interventions, uh, particularly propensity score matching is, is a very popular technique. Um, but last week we really just focused on single variables, matching on single variables. And this week we'll extend things into, uh, you know, multiple dimensions there with, uh, you know, uh, theoretically an unlimited number of variables that we're uh, trying to close the back doors for. Uh, so uh, running example throughout the rest of the chapter in involves uh, the study trying to gauge the intrinsic motivations of American politicians. Uh, and basically just a quick overview of how that worked. Uh, these emails were sent to state legislators asking for uh, unemployment benefits information. Um, the, these emails were authored by a, a fictional person uh, named Tyrone Washington. And, you know, in America, that, you know, that, that name, um, it tends to be associated with, um, you know, a black individual. So um, the, the legislator probably would have interpreted this as coming from, uh, you know, an African-American, a, a black individual. And uh, really what was what they were trying to measure in this study is whether, uh, for, first of all, if there were differences between re response rates for black legislators versus non-black, um, but more importantly, was the re is there a difference in the response rate um, when the email came from a, an in-district or out-of-district um, constituent, uh, uh, you know, person within the, the, the geographic boundaries that the, uh, the, uh, legislator, uh, has authority over. Right. And, uh, you know, the idea there is if, if the black legislator responds more often to these out of district requests, then perhaps he or she is more intrinsic, intrinsically motivated to, to help others and, and not just extrinsic, extrinsically motivated uh, right to to help out voters so that they he or she can get reelected. So that that's kind of the the long winded uh, version of that. Um, and and so most of the code examples in the book involve that data set that uh, was used for the study. Um, we may or may not have time to go over any of those, however. All right. So if we're planning to match. Uh, you know, individual variables as opposed to propensity score matching. Uh, the most common metric uh, that we see out in the wild is what's called uh, Mahalanobis distance. And we have the the, the formula for this here. You know, it, it kind of looks like a z-score, uh, right? Particularly for like a multivariate normal distribution. Um, you know, really, we have you know x one minus x two. These are are vectors. So, so really, you know, uh, vectors representing all the different variables uh, together, uh, the distances. And uh, the author calls out in the book, um, you know, like in, in data science world, you know, the most common distance metric is Euclidean distance. Um, and you could technically uh, use something like that for matching purposes as well. But there are some extra benefits. Uh, to Mahal Mahalanobis distance. Um, one, uh, the variables are standardized to be on a similar scale. I, I guess that's true of Euclidean distance generally as well, if you're employing that, like in a data science application, like a regularized regression, like an L1, L2 regression, you would still standardize the variables. So you're not um, attributing more importance to some variables based on the scale. Um, so the same kind of principle applies here. Um, but the added benefit is that we're um, accounting for the covariance uh, between the variables. Um, and so the, the 
benefit of, of accounting for those covariances is that we avoid overweighting um, on one particular uh, like latent characteristic is I think the way it's described. So in the book, there were examples of like a latent characteristic could be manliness, right? Like masculinity. And you might have a variable for like uh, beard hair length and <laughs> the amount of arm hair, th things like that. And they're obviously going to be very related. Um, and so uh, by using this, uh, the inverse of the covariance matrix, sometimes it's called the precision matrix in this formula, we are trying to remove uh, some of those redundancies. All right, so uh, one issue when we're trying to match on uh, many variables is you run into what's called the curse of dimensionality. Um, the basic principle here is that um, as you keep adding more variables, uh, you know, in this really high n-dimensional space, uh, the further away observations uh, seem to be from one another. And there's some interesting examples uh, in, in the book about this. Uh, uh, I think with like a skyscraper, right? If you're just <laughs> um, looking at two people and they're they're working in both working in offices in the southwest corner of a of a of a high rise building office tower. But once you add like the third dimension, like one is on the first floor, one's on the 35th floor, right? So they're, <laughs> um, I, I thought that was just kind of a, an interesting intuitive way to look at it. Um, long story short, you, um, you know, there's data becomes very sparse um, as you uh, introduce more and more dimensions. Uh, things get uh, really further away from each other. Um, and the, the point of matching, right, is to find similar examples. And uh, that becomes a problem with, with many, many variables. So what can we do about this? Uh, you know, one thing you could do is just limit the number of variables that you're matching on. Um, that sounds great. Um, but if you're just, <laughs> um, if, you're, if you're not accounting for variables uh, that are confounders, um, it, that, you know, you may be leaving back doors open. Um, and, and so that's going to be an issue when you're trying to do your uh, trying to gauge like a treatment effect. Another thing you can do is just get more data. I mean, we always want more data. There's never enough of it. Uh, easier said than done. But if you can get more data, that's going to help um, with with that uh, cursed dimensionality issue. Um, other things you can do is increase the caliper. We talked about this last week. It's really um, how um, how closely uh, uh, it's establishing a threshold of how how bad your matches can be before you, you throw them out. Um, and usually those calipers are based on standard deviations. Um, and, and there was a- question about the Mahalanobis um, yeah. distance. So does that yeah. mean that we can throw in a lot of variables that essentially measure the same thing because we have the covariance matrix in there so we don't have to worry about that as much? Well, you're right. So the Mahalanobis uh, output is a, is a single score, right? Just kind of yeah. like propensity score matching. So, so yes, you yeah. can theoretically throw in as many variables as you want. Uh, I, I think the, the distance is, is kind of the problem is your matches are going to get poor if yeah. you, if you have kind of an unlimited number there of, yeah. okay. of variables, but yeah, it's, it's, it's nice in the same way that propensity score matching is nice is because it, it, again, it comes down to a single, single score. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. No, of course. I mean, I want this to be a, a dialogue. I'm just <laughs> going a little quick because we have so, so many sections in this, yes. <laughs> this uh, text here. Right. So um, alternative to, um, you know, the, the standard matching approach we talked about, it, 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 there's Corson exact matching, CEM for short. And so this is really, um, we talked about this last week, actually, a, a little bit. And so the idea is you only match uh, in an exact manner. So if you're dealing with categorical variables, um, those have to match um, exactly between treatment and observation. Uh, if you're dealing with uh, continuous variables, you would bin them and, and match on the bins uh, because we know that you know it's, it's very hard to, to match on a continuous variable exactly so you you kind of you coarsen it through the the, the binning uh, this tends to be a pretty popular approach for big data uh, projects and the data science community apparently this is 
um, uh, very popular uh, a pro of this approach is that it's uh, the computational requirements are quite low. Um, the algorithm's simple. It's kind of like, do I have a match or not, right? If not, then um, you know you, you're probably going to end up dropping some observations. Um, cons of this approach is that you know it, this is always a problem when you have many matching variables. Like it, it's going to be hard to find that exact match. Um, you can't always get the large sample sizes that you need to do this sort of approach. Um, and it can lead to many treated observations being dropped. Um, and when you do that, you, you know, you may not be measuring the, the treatment effect, uh, that you want. And of course your standard errors might not be low enough because your sample size is too, too small. What, how, how would you choose the bins there? Because that would also be an option that you have two observations that are actually quite close to each other, but you have the bin threshold right between them, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, anytime you discretize things, that's going to be a problem. And, uh, you know, there's some good code examples in the book. Uh, you know, I think the, the most common way would be, or two, two common approaches would be uh, just divide everything into quantiles, mm -hmm. right? You could do, you know, just uh, five bins in, in a quantile manner or deciles. Uh, you know, another approach would be to just do equal bins, right? So it's not really quantiles. It's just, you know, you have a, a width of five, you know, between mm -hmm. each each bin, right? Just based whatever the scale is, that might make sense. So it's there's definitely uh, judgment that goes into that, of course, that, that could impact your, your findings. So, um, I, I think that's, that's one thing, you know, a common theme from last week is there are just so many, um, artistic choices with matching, um, that it can be a bit overwhelming. And, you know, in my mind, if I were doing this in real life, you'd, you'd want to sensitivity, uh, test, you know, things like your, your bin sizes or just, to, just to make sure you're, uh, you know, the, the treatment effect that you're measuring at the end of the day doesn't vary drastically based on these choices. Yeah. So probably just play around a bit. And if it stays the same, then you should be on the good side. Yeah. And I don't know if you you had a chance to get through the, the chapter or not, uh, Sarah, or run any of the code examples. But one thing that surprised me um, is like, we're basically using the same data set for a lot of the examples. And depending mm -hmm. on the approach, uh, sometimes you would see a treatment effect and sometimes you wouldn't. And by that, I mean, yes, sometimes you get like a statistically significant P value, right? But not only that, I mean, the treatment effect itself sometimes would be like close to zero and sometimes it would be like, it would look big, like nine, like, um, like nine, I think it was, like, was it a, um, yeah, it was response rate. So it was a proportion. And so I think in one case you'd see like a 0% difference in proportions. And then another, it was a nine percentage point difference. Yeah. So that's kind of scary that um, your methodology would create potentially very different results. Yeah, that makes selling the methodology very important, I guess. Yes. Yeah. And um, we'll get to this in a, in a bit. But the, the thing that I, I found most difficult about all of these different approaches has to do with the measuring of the standard errors. And if you just Google this, there are so many different techniques out there and people that support various ways of estimating standard errors. And, and um, you know, some will say, do it this way. Others will say, absolutely not. Um, you know, like you can bootstrap standard errors, um, but they're, you know, obviously different ways to bootstrap things. And, um, you know, that the, the manner in which you measure your standard errors um, determines whether or not you're finding a statistically significant uh, result, right? Um, and so that's that's a real real challenge from what I can gather. And, um, you know, we don't go too deep into that sort of stuff in this chapter, but um, I think if you were to, you know, publish a study, that's something people would probably tear apart or really focus on is how you're calculating your standard errors in addition yeah. to probably your overall methodology. Yeah, there's this new paper called uh, Not So Standard Errors. And I think they um, asked a lot of teams of scientists to um, uh, well, do a regression on basically the same thing. And then they checked whether those standard errors are aligned. Um, and they 
didn't so much. Yeah. They did when there was like a a whole um process of having referees look over it, then they kind of converged. But yeah, there was a lot of variation in there. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I don't know. I, I feel like this area of research also is still um uh very active, right? And and maybe some best practices are still being sorted out. Um uh, but but anyway, a, a Google search on this stuff is is kind of overwhelming because you do get a ton of different opinions and you find a, a bunch of uh, different papers on this stuff. Yeah, um, wow. yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, so uh, before we move on, there is one technique that's uh, relatively new. The author doesn't really go into this in much detail. It's it's kind of like a prelude to say like. Hey, you might want to explore this um, on your own. It's called entropy balancing. And it is uh it's it's a weighting method as opposed to just, I think, finding mat like one-to-one -one matches. Um the author likens it to method of moments. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. I you know, like I've fit theoretical distributions to empirical data in the past, right? And like one way you can do that is through like maximum likelihood, um, but you can also use method of moments to do that. So you're trying to match on like, you know, the the, the first moment or, you know, like the the mean or uh, the raw second moment or, or the central second moment, which would be variance, right? Or you could, you could match on the uh, observed skewness, right? So like the third moments there. Um, and I guess this method is pretty flexible um, where you're trying to match between observational and, and treatment data using weights um, so that, again, it, it conforms, the distribution conforms. It's not just the mean necessarily. You can say, I want to, I want this thing to look similar in terms of second moments, third moments, et cetera. Um, he doesn't really give a lot of cons to this technique other than it's kind of complex. So he doesn't go into the details of how it works. Um, you know, I, I think he's kind of foreshadowing that this may be become um, much more popular in the future. Whereas I think today propensity score matching, at least in the, the fields that I'm familiar with, um, you know, propensity score matching seems to be very, very popular. So that's a, a good segue into propensity score matching. I think we maybe uh, alluded to that very a little smooth. bit last week. What is that? Very smooth. Very smooth. <laughs> Um, you would typically run a, a logit or a probit uh, type regression where your outcome is a uh, probability of being treated and your uh, explanatory variables in this case um, would be those uh, back doors that you're trying to close. And like any other sort of regression problem, you, you know, there's some artistic choices. Uh, well, you know, there, there's there's different functional forms you could you could uh, use to construe your model to, to construct your model. You know, like whether or not to include interaction terms, polynomials, etc. Um, and I think the normal rules about checking for model fit kind of apply here. Um, but the idea here is. You know, you have these back doors represented by A and a, and a DAG, and if you're controlling for treatment propensity, um, those back doors really can't influence treatment itself because treatment pr propensity stands in, in in between the the back doors and and treatment itself. So that's that's the main idea, and you can apply matching to propensity scores like a one to one type approach like you would on Mahalanobis distance, but it's more common to apply this inverse probability of treatment weighting. So um, generally speaking, you're not really throwing out any observations per se um, in the treatment or observational groups. It's really just re-weighting um, either side uh, so that they, they look kind of similar to each other. Um, and then there's just kind of some tidbits, like short uh, passages on, on how you can check to make sure that once you've 
once you've uh, created your model, built your model, that you're closing back doors. And what you can do is you can split your propensity score into bins. Again, that's kind of an artistic choice in terms of how many bins you'd want. But then you'd want to see whether uh, any of your matching variables are actually related to treatment um, within any of those bins. Um, and you would hope that there would not be. So you could probably graphically check this, um, maybe do some sort of chi-square test um, yeah, just, just to see if, uh, yeah, there is a, some sort of correlation there. Um, but the idea is if you have similar propensity scores between a treatment and a an, uh, control, um, really there, there shouldn't be um, much of a, a difference there. Okay, so uh, just a couple of issues with uh, propensity score matching. High dimensions is 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 um, is, is still going to be a problem here, just like it is in standard approaches. Um, again, it's the the issue where like your data becomes sparse as you introduce, you know, um, many many dimensions, and um, nonlinearity is a is, it can be a problem too. And what we mean by that is like, you know, you do have this even though we're using like most likely logistic regression where it, it is a GLM, it's not technically a, a linear function. The, uh, the predict, you know, you do still have this linear um, expression um, that's used uh, in that logistic regression function. And, you know, you have to consider like whether or not to introduce like quadratic terms and, and, and interactions, like I mentioned before, and, um, that can take a little work, right, to get the right functional form. And so just a couple ideas here uh, to uh, refinements on the propensity score matching approach is you can, um, there's something called high dimensional propensity score estimation. This this seems a little funky to me where it's like you're limiting the the list of your total covariates based on some sort of theoretical importance. Um, and so by definition, you're, you're including kind of a, a lower, um, number of variables in your, in your model. Um, didn't really, um, go into detail, like I said, in the, in the book. So that might be a Google search. It, um, but the other approaches that were mentioned, like machine learning based approaches, which I thought were interesting. Um, regularized regression, if you're familiar with um, lasso or ridge regression, um, you know, if you have a ton of variables, um, this this tends to um, work pretty well. And, even, and if you have highly collinear variables, um, you know, regularized regressions uh, sometimes does a good job of uh, uh, making collinearity, multicollinearity less of an issue at, as it relates to generating good propensity scores. Um, and then another thing you could do uh, is boosted regression. Think of XGBoost, if you're familiar with that, or light GBM, these, these um, you know, those really common machine learning models for, for tabular data sets. Um, the, the good thing with, with those is that they'll, because, the, you know, usually those are based on a lot of decision trees, uh, you know, ensembles of decision trees, you can pick up on a lot of nonlinear relationships without explicitly modeling them. What about like something like principal component analysis that would reduce the dimensionality as well, right? It would. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Because that, that does uh, create uh, independent components, right? By, by definition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there's after we finish this book, I, I really want to get into um, this causal ML book, um, which is another kind of free resource online, mm -hmm. um, which seems just really, really interesting and probably a little bit more modern in terms of how folks are using machine learning today. Yeah. Um, for this high dimensionality propensity score estimation, does the model pick it for you? Or do you go into your literature and try and figure out what the literature says and then take those variables? Yeah, that's a good question. The book didn't really say, but it's based on theoretical importance, right? So like the, 
wouldn't that have to be based on some sort of subjective reasoning as opposed to just a pure quantitative um, score? I, I don't know. Um, again, you know, maybe I missed something here, but it, it was a very, um, you know, it, it was like a one or two sentence kind of thing yeah. um, in, in the book. So I'm not sure how popular that that is, but um, something, something to check out for, uh, if you really want to go deep on this stuff. Okay. We're actually doing okay on time. So, uh, assumptions, right. That we make in, in doing matching. I, I think the big one, Sarah, and you brought this up last week is that like you have all of the variables that you need, right, to close back doors. Um, and I, I think we learned from those early chapters that that's really hard to do um, to get all the variables that you'd, you'd want, right? These all these enclose all these back doors. Um, there are these latent variables that are really hard to measure. Um, so, so we are really saying, you know, we have these observables, and that's all we need to close the back doors. Um, if you can disprove that, you know, that really limits um, the credibility of your of, of your findings, ultimately. And, and so this all goes back to the idea of conditional independence, meaning all of your back doors are closed. Um, in other words, uh, we're saying there is no omitted variable bias. And, and um, another term that I've seen thrown around which I believe is kind of the same thing as conditional independence is ignorability, um, which basically says, you know, if you have the same set of observed covariates between, uh, you know, two individuals, then assignment of treatment is essentially random, right? So I, I believe that's basically getting at the same thing as uh, independence but um, you may have seen that term ignorability thrown around. Okay, uh, so key assumption uh, is that there must be um, significant overlap in the distribution of uh, the, the, the matching variables when you're looking at a treatment and a control population. Um, and if you're using just propensity scores, um, the the um, there must be substantial overlap in those propensity scores. Uh, and it's a lot easier to check a propensity score graphically than like if you had maybe dozens of variables, right? You'd have to kind of check you you might you might check each one um, separately. Uh, but in the chapter, there were few checks that were recommended. One is um, look for propensity scores close to, very close to zero or one, like a 0.999 or 0 0.0001. Um, when you find those kind of outlier probabilities, oftentimes that means there's not gonna be overlap between your two populations. Um, an another thing to look for to, to make sure you have some overlap is that you're not dropping a very large percentage of your treated observations um, because you couldn't, couldn't find matches. Um, and then again, you just make some plots um, to, to graphically check to see if there's overlap. So uh, the graph on the left here, um, this is just comparing uh, uh, one of the matching variables, percentage black in the district. Um, and then we're plotting to um, distributions for the, this is basically the, the treatment variable, black legislator versus non-black legislator. And, um, you know, the, the distributions are very um, different and that's okay. They, 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 they can be different. Um, there's no requirement that they, they look the same here. It's just that there has to be enough overlap uh, at various points um, on the on the on the charts, uh, right? So that um, so that we can kind of do these adjustments, so that we have more of an apples to apples comparison. Um, so the graph that you're showing here that would already be enough common support. 
I think that's uh, up for debate. And I, that's, that was the, the point in the, in the book as well. Um, when I see density here, I don't know if that, that doesn't necessarily mean a, a raw count. Right. Um, but if you only have like two observations in a, you know, a, a key area that you're interested in, like you can see for black legislators, they're, they're typically in areas where they're, um, you know, there, there's a, a, a high black population, right? That they're representing between 50 and like 75%. And so, you know, you look at the density for the non-black legislators and there doesn't look like there's a ton of observations here, right? Um, and so, you know, you, you kind of need to look at that. You know, are, do you only have a couple observations that you're, that you have that, that really um, to compare, right? And I, I, a problem, one problem you might have is that you're really overweighting just a couple observations on the on the um, yeah the non-treated population, uh, right? To to make it look you know more like the the treated population, and so you know that that's going to limit the credibility of what you have there. Um, that that's a really big issue. And so uh, there are things you can do um, when you don't have good support. One thing you could do is um, you just don't match at all where you don't have good support. Um, so just drop those treatment observations. And that's OK, potentially, if you're not dropping a, an extremely high percentage. Um, you know, to some degree, if you're using a matching algorithm with a caliper, you're already doing this automatically, right? Dropping um, observations because there was no good match. Uh, and then, you know, propensity score matching is very popular. There's some heuristics here that that was mentioned in the book. And, and again, the author freely admits that this is these are arbitrary numbers. But like one thing you could do, for instance, is say, in a given propensity score bin, uh, you know, with 0 0.02, um, make sure you have at least 10 observations. Um, and, and I'm guessing that's, you know, most likely on your, your non-treated observational bucket, uh, to, to match with your treated. Um, and if you don't, you need to, to kind of drop those, uh, treatment observations. And then, you know, we talked about there's, there's problems with, um, propensity scores close to zero or one. You could, um, just trim anything that's, that's really, uh, large or really small. So if you're finding propensity scores below 1% or above 99%, you might want to just remove those entirely. Um, you could uh, create quantiles of your propensity scores and just say everything above the 98th percentile, uh, we're going to trim those or you know below the second percentile. Um, and, and there's, you know, just another technique here um, I'm not going to go into, but it's it's all kind of the same basic ideas removing some of these outlier uh, propensity score numbers. And this is interesting. Uh, this is just a graphical example of, hey, like we didn't think that propensity scores uh, for black and non-black legislators actually looked good across the spectrum of scores. So like really there's this narrow range between zero and 25% propensity where there was adequate support. Um, and, you know, if you compare that to this earlier graph, you know, it, it just, it, it looks like we're dealing with a much different set of observations. And, you know, here's a key point. If we are dropping a lot of observations, you know, um, the best we can do is we can say that the treatment effect, we, we can maybe make a, a statement about the treatment effect among the individuals that matched well. Um, and so, but that may not actually... <laughs> those matches may not represent the population you're truly interested in, right? Um, ho hopefully that makes sense. So, so you have this larger treatment population, but if you're dropping a lot of of those, those treatment uh, observations, what you're left with may not look like the original population. And, and so that may dilute really what you're trying to show. Okay. Yeah, it just makes it really difficult, right? If you have it sure does. A, in in a case like you just showed, where 
um, there is just no white mayor when the black population is over 50%, then what are you going to do? There's just no counterfactual. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this, you might not, I mean, there's a possibility that your data just is, is not adequate uh, to support what you're trying to do here. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that, yeah, that, that graph on the left here is, is kind of that case in point. It really doesn't look like you have a lot of examples where you have, um, you know, high black population, but the, the legislator is, is non-black. Yeah, and that, that's a problem endogenous yeah and and yeah you can maybe apply weights to still make things look similar but you're relying on a very small subset of uh uh the the control group uh to adjust to get there and and that's um again that's that's gonna that's gonna create problems um you're right and you're gonna question the uh um, the output of what you're uh, you're getting um, at the end of the day. All right, so um, one thing you need to do with really any observational uh, um, analyses uh, where you're trying to figure out a treatment effect, and this is true of randomized experiments as well, you want to make sure you have um, covariate uh, balance or propensity score balance. Um, and ideally, you know, all these backdoor variables would look the same between the treatment and control groups. And, you know, just a couple things you could do if you're not getting good balance and you're, you're doing like propensity score matching, you might want to just try a different form of the propensity score matching, uh, or sorry, propensity score model. We talked about introducing uh, squared terms, interactions, et cetera. Um, that's one thing you can do. Try using different calipers um, if, if the balance isn't, isn't where it needs to be. And so it's an iterative process. Um, don't expect necessarily that you're going to get great balance uh, immediately. There is a bit of trial and error to it. And um, Sarah, I don't know if you've, you've probably seen these probably in your own work, right? Where you, you are checking for Covariate balance. These are pretty pretty standard. Um, whether or not you're doing matching, um, looking at uh, the differences uh, between treatment and control, and and here it's before matching and after matching. Um, you know, but you know, if you were doing a randomized control experiment, you'd still want to check to make sure that um, you know some of your variables, uh, your covariates were, were aligning well. And typically you have kind of like an average of the variable and then um, like uh, standard deviations as well to see if there's a st statistically significant difference uh, between between variables here. Um, and this table is also showing kind of the, the treatment effect itself um, before and after matching with the standard deviation. Um, and, and hopefully that makes sense. Um, generally, these tables are, again, are, are comparing means, but that's not the only way to check for, um, you know, good balance. Another thing you might want to do is look at the distributions of your treated and controlled populations as well. And this first graph is just an example where I think the idea is the means are the same but the distributions are really different. Um, and of course, before you uh, apply matching, right, using your control population, you wouldn't expect the distribution to look similar to the treatment. But if you are doing matching, you know, kind of just limiting the observations that you're using from the control population, you're selecting the ones that, that did align with the treated group. You would think that, you know, selected group of controls would would have a similar distribution to the the treatment population and if it doesn't um you know that that could be a problem and you may need to kind of go back to see if there's some way you can achieve better balance and um but these two graphs are back to looking at all the different distributions of the variables you're waiting with right 
Yeah, and so this could be a challenge if you have a ton of variables, right? Yeah. And in reality, I don't I don't know how often this is performed. I've certainly seen these kind of tables uh, in the past. I think they're they're standard in in um, academic literature. Um, I can't say I've seen it seen a bunch of these uh, histograms comparing the distributions, but this gives you uh, you know extra confidence because you're not just looking at the mean; you're looking at the whole distribution to make sure they're similar. Um, and then there's just a couple couple charts uh, looking at the propensity scores uh, as opposed to the matching variables uh, before and after some some weighting and, and trimming. And um, to be honest with you, I look at both of these and neither of them look great. Um, you know, there's more adjustments happening for the graph on the right. What I will say is for the propensity scores in the middle, the, the match looks pretty, you know, it kind of passes the eyeball test but what's a little scary is those propensity scores close to zero and one. Um, you, you know, this that would lead me to believe that we might want to throw those out altogether. I mean, those uh, theoretically speaking, those districts would probably be very different anyway, right? Because if you have a district where non-black or black population is about a hundred percent, that's probably going to differ in a lot of hours yeah. as well. Yep. That's right. Okay, uh, just one other thing we could uh, do, it's called a stratification test. We effectively described this earlier, but you can again bin your propensity scores um, and then you know within those bins, check to see if um, treatment um, and, and the matching variables are related. They, they shouldn't be, um, but that's just another graphical uh, test that you could do. And a um, couple more sections here. So, um, you know, generally we're interested in, in determining a, a treatment effect. And the main point here is, you know, taking a difference, a weighted mean, right, between a treatment and control group value is pretty straightforward to do. Um, what is what is more difficult is calculating an appropriate standard error. Um, and this is where we kind of get into this idea that you might want to bootstrap. There are some analytic formulas out there to calculate the standard errors that are maybe not so uh, straightforward. Um, a lot of the, the matching software, I guess, kind of knows these formulas, right? So it, it does the work for you but you might want to look at the, um, the documentation on this. Um, and again, I don't know how closely you looked, Sarah, at the, the code um, in the chapter, but for, for a lot of these, you know, there's, there's um, procedures to get the, 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 the control population to look like the treatment population. Once we have that taken care of, the author is typically doing like what looks like a t test, you right to to measure the statistical significance of the of the treatment effect, but it's done through a linear regression, right? Because like there's an equivalence there if your only explanatory variable is is that binary like treatment, yes or no. Um, but he also has like these comments in the code that says things like, "Hey, the standard errors aren't right for this." <laughs> so even though I'm doing basically this t test, like don't do it this way in practice. Um, because it's understating the standard errors. Uh, and, and the reason why it is is because, you know, we are doing all these pre-processing steps um, to find these matches or, or, or um, finding these weights um, that are estimated using our sample data. And so, you know, you're going to get different results based on different samples. So the idea behind bootstrapping is that you are, you know, obviously kind of sampling with replacement, getting different sample observations each time you're doing the bootstrapping procedure. And so then your your weights are going to be different. If you're doing matching, your your matches are going to be different each time for each bootstrap. So there's additional uncertainty um, that's being modeled out each time. So you get a more robust standard error. 
um, by taking all of that into account via the bootstrap. Whereas if you just do all your pre-processing steps to, to get like a, a treatment and control population that looks similar and then just run a t-test on it or linear regression, it, you're you're not considering that additional uncertainty, um, uh, you know, that was baked into that estimation process to make the two populations look similar. Does that does that make sense at a at a high level? Yeah, pre-processing increases uncertainty because we're adding just so much variation and yes, shuffling stuff around. So that makes sense that you'd have to account for it later. Yeah. Yeah, and again, so I guess a lot of the, the the matching software already accounts for this. You can do your own bootstrapping to have more robust standard errors. Um, but there's a there's a lot of caveats around the bootstrapping too. Um, there's an example in the book. Um, you can do stand like a standard bootstrapping procedure if you're just using kind of a weighted approach. But if you're doing one to one matching where you're throwing out a lot of observations. Um, there's specialized bootstrapping procedures. So, um, yeah, you gotta be really careful with that step. And, and again, we, we talked about that a little earlier, like there's, there seems to be some disagreement in the community about the best approaches for, for measuring standard error. And, um, uh, it, it's an important step and, uh, it, it is called out there. Okay. Uh, not going to spend a ton of time on this uh, piece, but there are actually procedures out there where you can combine matching and regression approaches together. And I guess in, in some respects, right, propensity score matching does involve regression. But in some of these doubly robust estimation procedures, um, you are doing effectively matching um, but then you're doing regression where you still have these control variables that are your matching variables. Uh, it, it almost feels like you're doing the same thing twice. Um, but I guess that the benefit of some of these approaches is that you get lower standard errors. And if, say, your functional form for your regression model was was not quite right, um, a doubly robust approach um, uh, is 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 maybe more immune to to model misspecification. Um, so, so there's just some good properties around uh, some of these other uh, approaches. Um, author does not go very deep at all into it, to this stuff, just to say that hey, th this is this is out there. Um, let's see, uh, entropy balancing was was that one technique that we talked about earlier. Uh, that is considered a doubly robust approach, uh, so you might want to check that out. Um, Another thing is when you're measuring the uh, treatment effect, you know, I kind of have this, this equation out here. This is like the really basic example where this is effectively like a t-test, um, right? Where you're trying to measure the significance of the, the uh, uh, you know, treated population or non-treated population. And the the black legislator study had had um, a little bit more of a complex regression procedure where the author included additional variables in the regression that weren't these backdoor matching variables. They were just additional variables uh, that he included here. And there was an interaction term as well uh, that was really the effect that he was trying to measure. Um, Again, I'm not going to get into the details about that here. I don't know if that's super important, but um, after you're done doing your matching procedure, you still might end up having to do like a, a somewhat complex regression analysis at the end of the day. It may look like something that's more complicated than than like a basic t test. Um, that that you know this is would be equivalent to this this uh, basic regression equation. Okay, so we're getting through the material, which is great. Uh, in earlier chapters, we talked about like what is the treatment effect that we're actually measuring. And for most of the examples that we we've looked at, like the standard matching approach, you know we we focused on the op um, the control population, right? Either 
um, throwing out some of those controls or weighting them in a manner so that it more closely resembles the uh, treated population. So given that, you know, what we are basically uh, measuring is the um, average uh, effect on the treated population, the ATT. Um, the author has this, this note that we're not exactly doing that, um, but he doesn't really go into why it's not. It's like an approximation of ATT, average treatment effect on the treated. Um, but it, it, it's effectively what we've been doing with, with matching. Um, if we wanted to get the average treatment effect on the untreated, we could just revise our approach um, instead of trying to match to the treated population, we could match to the um, untreated population, right? Uh, so, so we're essentially throwing out treated uh, observations uh, potentially or reweighting that treated population to look like the, the, the non-treated group. So it, it, I think that makes sense. And then if you have um, the ATT and the ATUT, you can actually back into the average treatment effect overall just by weighting by the proportion uh, of, of uh, observations in the treated population, you know, and then uh, the proportion in the untreated population together, kind of a, a, a linear weighting to get the average treatment effect. And then uh, this is this is the last note I had. This is uh, for propensity score matching. The, the most common thing to do, of course, is use the inverse probability weighting. And the examples he used in his group and his throughout most of the chapter um, would actually measure the average treatment effect because we're applying um, a separate set of weights to the, the treated group and the untreated group. Um, and, but if we wanted the average treatment effect on the treated, we can get there as, as well, uh, with propensity score matching by just leaving the weights at one for the treated population and then um, you know, it's a it's a separate set of weights, p over one minus p. So these are propensity scores uh, on the untreated population. And you do something kind of similar uh, where you'd you'd have a weight of one point oh on the untreated population, then you'd have an adjustment for the treated population if you're trying to come up with the ATUT average treatment effect on the untreated. So I think that's that's really cool um, how flexible propensity score matching is to get different treatment effects, um, depending on what you're interested in. Uh, and just a call out, like you always look at the modeling software, uh, to see, you know, kind of what the default assumption is, what treatment effect is it trying to, to measure? Um, a lot of times you'll see like an argument, like, you know, ATT might be the default argument, but you might be able to back into another type of treatment effect just by changing uh, one of the function arguments. That's really All right. I did not know that. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, that is all I had. And I'm pleasantly surprised that we were able to get through um, all of the material in the hour. Uh, yeah, that was a lot of material. Should I hit stop? Yeah, let's do stop.